I'm going to take a quick second to introduce myself. Uh, I'm Stephen Chase. I'm with World Education Services. Glad to see you and thank you for joining us. Uh, today's session is going to equip you with some information to help you also some questions to ask that you'll need as it relates to credential evaluations and their wide range of purposes and uses. So my colleague Sarah has been giving these types of presentations for almost six years now. So she's across the greater Toronto area. So she's heard a lot of questions and uh, provided information to a large group of people. So uh, she's had a lot of experience around this. So it's great to have her present. Um, so how this is going to work today, she's going to just give a brief overview uh, on some important notes. And then followed by that, we'll have a period of question and answer where we can dig into more detail uh, to some specific questions you may have. Uh, at the end of the session, we'll have a little post survey. So if you would be so kind as to fill that out and help us um, uh, make these webinars even better. I just, uh, with that, I guess I'll turn it over to Sarah. All right. Okay. Hey, so good morning, everybody. If it's 10 o'clock in your area as well. Um, as Stephen mentioned, my name is Sarah. And I am from World Education Service. And today's session is really going to be a, a general information session about whether or not you may need to get your credentials evaluated, and most importantly, about credential recognition and understanding that. So those are my best hopes for the session. So I want to start off by explaining the difference between credential evaluation and credential recognition. So credential evaluation is when an organization, when an evaluation agency takes your education from outside Canada and we compare it to the Canadian standards. So, so typically a report will state what your Canadian equivalency is. So, for example, they would say your Canadian equivalency is, so your degree from back home is equivalent or the same as a bachelor's degree here in Canada. So a credential evaluation would state this kind of information. But the more important part or the most important part is credential recognition, and that is the acceptance of your credential evaluation report or your international academic documents at face value by the end user. Now, who is an end user? An end user could be anyone of an employer, an institution, a licensing body, an immigration office, or apprenticeship. So these end users will be the ones to give you recognition or acceptance of your credentials. So for example, if an employer hires you based on your past credential, that is recognition. Or, sorry, I guess. Sorry, and just as you're going forward, if anything comes to mind in terms of questions, just type them into the chat box and we'll try to uh, go through those at the end of the, in the Q&A questions. Sorry, go ahead. Thanks, Peter. Um, and another example of credential recognition is if you are looking to apply to university or college, and that, that institution grants you admissions into the program based on your past credentials, that is recognition. So again, these end users are the ones to give you recognition, sorry, are the ones to give you recognition as well as letting you know what their credential recognition standards or processes are. So oftentimes, many people think just because I get my credentials evaluated, it will automatically mean that it will be recognized. This is incorrect. This information is not how it works here in Canada. Um, so really, you need to first determine exactly sorry, what it is that you want to do, your goals, and then do your research. And then for your goal, find out what the end users require. Because each end user, they all have a different requirement or recognition process. So these are the five reasons that you should get your credentials evaluated for employment purposes, higher continuing education, licensure, immigration, or apprenticeship. So if you are not getting your credentials evaluated for any of these purposes, really, you should hold off. Don't get a credential evaluation just yet until you decide exactly 
what purpose that you're getting your credentials evaluated. And again, doing the research to figure out what these end users require and then getting the evaluation that, will, that the end user will recognize. Okay, so we've already gone through the steps. So again, when choosing a credential evaluation agency, first start off about, again, why you're getting your credentials evaluated, do your research, and then get the evaluation service that the agency or the end user will accept and recognize. Okay, so we'll go into each, uh, um, each of the purposes a little bit just to give you more details. So for employment purposes, you would get your credentials evaluated so that the employer can understand what your credential means here in Canada because most employers, they don't understand or recognize it. Also, getting your credentials evaluated for employment purposes will provide the employer proof and confidence that your education is equivalent to something here in Canada. Um, but as mentioned earlier, every employer has a different standard when it comes to credential recognition. Um, so you will have some employers that will accept any evaluation agency. Typically, that's, that's the case. If you are getting your credentials evaluated for employment purposes, again, typically most employers will accept any evaluation agency. Um, there will be other employers that do require a specific evaluation service. So, on their job postings, most of them will say, if you are internationally educated, please get your credentials evaluated by, sometimes they list the following agencies, and sometimes they only list one. So you have to go with the one that the employer recognizes or accepts. And lastly, you may run into employers who don't care about you getting your credentials evaluated. It's not necessary. It's not a mandatory step. Um, so as we went through, these are all different scenarios, so it's important for you to look up a few employers. If you are looking for employment, look up three to five different companies that you are looking to apply to and see what their job postings are saying. If they don't mention anything about credential evaluation, give them a call or email them just to ask them for more information. Typically, in the entry-level positions, they don't require a credential evaluation. But as you move up within the company, that's when the credential evaluation becomes more important. So moving on to higher continuing education. If you are thinking about going back to school, your first contact should be the institution, especially the program that you are interested in applying to, because every institution, no matter what program, they all have a different requirement. You would get your credentials evaluated for higher continuing education for the purposes of um, admissions, and also you may have an opportunity to get credit transfers or block transfers. Um, so what is the reality and what is what do institutions usually require? Um, again, this is all different depending on the institution and the program that you are applying to. Um, so in one institution, they'll offer, let's say, 80 different programs. Half of those programs will specify that you do use an evaluation agency. The other half, all still within the same institution, will require you to get your documents directly from back home, sent directly to the new school that you are planning on attending, and the new school will do their own evaluation. And lastly, a credential evaluation is just one part of the process to gain admission. There will be other requirements when you are looking to gain admissions into a university or college. That might be an IELTS test, or uh, maybe you have to submit your resume or references, or maybe you have to pass, the, pass an exam. It just all depends on what program you're attending. So again, please check with the institution specifically for the program you are interested in attending. I've, I've worked at a university here in Toronto, and her note about checking with the program is very important because, uh, you know, as you all know, universities are quite large institutions, and some disciplines do things certain ways and others do it other ways. So it really is crucial that uh, uh, you check with that specific program in the faculty that you're looking to study for, because I know there's been instances in the past where people have said, well, you're uh, you know, the evaluation I had wasn't accepted for admissions, but that might have been admissions in one program rather than the other. So it's really, it is, as Sarah said, do your, do your, figure out what your goal is, then do your research, and then take your next steps following that research. 
Okay. Uh, lastly, life insurance. So we have regulated professions here um, all across Canada and the States and wherever you go. Um, so typically with Ontario, we have, I think, 40 regulated professions where you have to get a license first before you can find employment. So typically these professions could be like a doctor, a nurse, a dentist. So they have to get their license as if they don't, no one will hire them. Um, there are luckier professions in this field where there is a license, but you could be in the process of getting your license, but you can also find work while you are in the process of getting your license. So professions like this could be a professional engineer or an architect or an accountant, right? They can find work in their field, but they may not be at the position that they want. They may not um, have the same pay as someone who's, who is licensed, and they may not say that they are licensed or designated with this title when they don't have their license. If you are getting your credentials evaluated for licensure purposes, you must contact your licensing body first. Find out exactly what the requirements are for credential evaluation. And also, when you contact them, this is a good opportunity for you to find out how long is it going to take you to get licensed. What do you need to do? Do you need to go back to school? Do you need to write some tests or exams? Do you need to do upgrading? Do you need working hours? You most likely will need a little bit of everything but to how many hours or how many exams, it's all dependent on your licensing body. Also, when you contact them, you're finding out this big picture. So this big picture might tell you that it's going to take you 10 years to get licensed. And everyone's life situation is different. So the 10 years might not be a problem for some, but some other people may think, hey, 10 years is way too long, and now I need to think of an alternative career. So it's, it's still great information because you, you find this information earlier on so that you can make new goals or alternative goals and then you can work towards those instead of wasting extra time doing something that you're not going to pursue. And it's important to note too that you know, alternative careers isn't a second choice in many respects. And in Canada, a, a lot of people do things outside of their academic background. It's just the nature of work in Canada and generally today. And I think of an example of someone that uh, I had spoken to that was a, a nurse from Central Europe and she struggled with going through the licensure process for becoming a nurse and she decided, well, I, you know, it's too much effort and time for me to really feel that I want to continue with it. And then she started working with an IT company that developed health-related software and, you know, very positive uh, employment opportunity for her and she's been doing that ever since. So uh, it's important to consider all of your options uh, that are available to, to you here in Canada because there is a wide array. And also to look at what, where careers are in demand because uh, perhaps in, uh, for example, in the east coast of Canada due to some uh, federal contracts, there's a lot of work for skilled tradespeople to do uh, shipbuilding, whereas out west uh, uh, geologists and um, or engineers are in high demand because of the oil industry. So it's important to look where in Canada best suits your education and also your goals. And to help you a little bit with job search, we've done some different uh, webinars in the past that uh, we'll put in the chat box that you can check out from our YouTube page. It's, it's about launching your job search in Canada with an employment agency and we also had one of Canada's largest banks participate in that. Also had some people talk about their experience uh, going through what we call bridge training programs. An individual was in uh, marketing and another one was in an engineering bridging program. So I uh, don't have a whole lot of time to tell you about bridging programs, but they're, they can be an effective uh, introduction in the Canadian labor market. We also did one on LinkedIn because LinkedIn is uh, very widely used here in Canada, depending upon your, your occupation, I suppose. Perhaps doctors don't use it as much as other uh, uh, professionals, but um, that resource exists. Also personal branding, that's important in terms of job search. And then there are some other pre-rival services such as the Canadian Immigrant Integration Program, 
ICT careers, if we have anyone in ICT, which I believe I saw in the registration as well. So I'll put that in the chat box for you guys to take a look at. Very good resource. Hopefully, at this time, you kind of have a better understanding about the importance of credential recognition, as that, again, is the acceptance of your credential evaluation or your academic documents at face value. And hopefully, you also have a better understanding of how a credential evaluation can be used. So again, it's determining or figuring out exactly why you're getting your credentials evaluated, and then doing the research to figure out exactly what the end user's requirements are. And lastly, how the end users will recognize or accept your credential evaluation, or sometimes your academic documents at face value. So your takeaways for this session, I know we're repeating it a lot, but we can't stress this up, stress this point enough because it will give you um, the right direction or the, the right next steps when it comes to credential evaluation. The worst thing that you could do is pay for an evaluation and not use it. It's not beneficial to you in any way. So again, make your goals. Determine exactly what you want to do and figure out a couple things that you want to do. Um, maybe a primary goal, a secondary goal, just in case that first one doesn't go as planned, and maybe a third one just for extra backup. And then do your research and lots of it and talk to people because the more you talk to people, the more information you will find out. But always get the information from the source. Mm -hmm. um, and lastly, pursue the evaluation agency or service that the end user will accept. Sometimes they won't need a credential evaluation by a third party agency. Sometimes they will do their own evaluation. So that's why when you do your research, you can find this information out again and providing you the next right step for credential evaluation. So as mentioned again, a credential evaluation is only a starting point to getting your credentials recognized. Very good. And a couple of points on the do your research. So many people joining us today are people that have come to WES for a credential evaluation for the Federal Skilled Worker Program. Now, WES is a national, it's not totally nationally accepted across the board organization. We partner with a lot of regulatory bodies and universities, but that said, not everyone accepts a WES evaluation. So you may think, I have a credential evaluation, I'm set, but that's not in fact the case. For example, we have people that have registered that are uh, one's a civil engineer. Now, if they're heading to Ontario, uh, a WES evaluation for to get licensed won't work. They need to go to Professional Engineers of Ontario to do that process. And it's an ever-evolving process because there's some work going forward potentially um, that there will be national bodies related to engineering, for example, that will do uh, credential evaluation for that profession. For example, nurses. We have a couple of nurses joining us. There is a national body that is doing that. Uh, uh, I, don't, I think we had a family physician uh, that registered for this event as well. So uh, West Credential Evaluation, if you happen to have one for the FSWP program, is fine. But if you want to pursue licensure, which is, just a side note, a very long uh, involved process just to set clear expectations, not, not, to, not that we don't want you to do it, but just to be, have clear expectations, uh, then you need to go to the medical... Uh, the Medical Council... Of Canada. Yeah. yeah. Um, so adding on to Stephen's point, there is... Again, not one universally accepted credential evaluation agency out there. So everybody's process is different. Everybody has a different recognition process. So in your lifetime, again, you may have to get more than one credential evaluation because each end user, as mentioned, they have their own requirements. So if you want to get licensed or you want to gain admissions into the university or college, they are the ones to let you know exactly what the requirements are. So you have to follow it in order to either gain entry or to start your licensing process. And uh, in the registration form, we asked some questions about what are your expectations of uh, challenges you may face coming to Canada for those that aren't here already. Uh, we do have people here in Canada as well. But uh, a lot of it was around employment. And as Sarah mentioned at the outset, uh, you really need to check with the employers because it can vary. And in even just having a credential evaluation, as she has in her slide right there, it's only a starting point. Should you have the opportunity to get into an interview stage with an employer, 
that's sort of the uh, third party verified that you've done this education, but you'll probably be tasked with articulating your skills and competencies in a, in a professional sense that relate to both your education and prior work experience uh, to a degree that you've probably not had to do before because, again, uh, the degree itself would be unfamiliar. So you need to articulate in what we would say was meaningful terms to the, again, end user, and in that case it would be the HR department, human resources department, or the hiring manager. So uh, doing a bit of looking into that will help you a lot as well. So, okay, there, there's one question so far. Uh, the question is, is WES the only body in Canada that provides this service? And the answer is no. Um, there are bodies across Canada that provide a service. You could find the bodies in, on CICIC, um, but in Ontario, we have three credential evaluation agencies, and WES is one of them, ITAS is another, and Comparative Education Services is the last one, all in Ontario. And I think Stephen's finding the credential evaluation agency so that you could see uh, what's available. I just put it in the chat. Now that's, um, that, that is related to, those are kind of overarching bodies, but again, if it's something uh, in a regulated occupation, you need to look even further because again, it may be the regulatory body itself that either specifies who they use as a credential evaluation service or they do it themselves. So the next question is, do I need a license to work as a professional? That depends. Yes. <laughs> you, the best thing to do if you're not sure if your profession is regulated or not, just go on to Google and type it in. And that, it will populate, it usually populates like licensing bodies or associations, and then from there you could gather more information. And to a certain degree, um, it's important to note you can do a variety of different things in a profession that may or may not require a, a license. So I know a lot of times with engineers, uh, engineering companies, depending upon what they do, may only in fact need one or two professionally licensed engineers to sign off on engineering official documents, whereas they would employ many people with essentially all those skills and competencies, but just not the authority to sign off on it. So there's both groups. And, and as a side note, for example, um, Engineers, uh, in speaking with uh, an assessment uh, association that's connected to engineers in Canada, I learned that um, in many cases, a high percentage of people that come to Canada with engineering degrees would technically classify as what we would call engineering technicians or technologists rather than a professionally licensed engineer. Not that you don't need a certification, engineering techn technician or technologist, but it's a bit different. So it's just important to know that there are a variety of different things you can do even without a license. Or if you are in the IT field, mm -hmm. such as a software engineer, typically they normally don't get their credentials, or sorry, typically they don't get a license because usually it's not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, typically in the IT field, when you are going for those job interviews or when you get to the next stage, they're just testing you. And once you, if you do land the job, they will know within yeah. a short period of time whether or not you are, you were qualified or you can code this or code that in order to uh, be successful at your job. So typically software engineers do not get licensed. Yeah, I mean the great part about, and A, it's a, depending upon where you go in Canada, in demand occupations, specifically software engineer, the great part is, I'll, I'll, I'm not a computer tech person, but C++ or HTML5 is the same here as it is in California as it is in India. So. Uh, if you can demonstrate that you have those skills and experience that they're looking for, you're, you're set. So this next question is a little bit tricky. I think it's, if your education from outside Canada, when it gets evaluated, it is not comparable to what you thought it would be. Um, so I guess, for example, maybe your bachelor's degree back home, when we evaluated it in Canada, it only equaled maybe it's not a complete bachelor's or maybe a college diploma, when this happens, it's all credential evaluations are compared to the Canadian standard. Once you get this evaluation report, then you could kind of decide what it is that you want to do, whether it's to go back to school to upgrade or get your full credential or full bachelor's degree, whatever other things that you may be interested in doing. Because depending on who you're giving this report to, so you're giving it to the end user. So it's up to the end user to interpret what this report means 
and if it's enough to qualify into whatever program or whatever next step that you want to do. I have one here around accounting and finance degree from Pakistan. Which agency should uh, they go for an evaluation? Again, it sort of depends on their goals. Mm -hmm. If it's coming to Canada through the Federal Skilled Worker Program, it's one of the three designated organizations, correct? If, for FSWP, yes. Um, but if you are looking to get your designation, you should definitely go to CPA first. Um, that should be your yeah. first step. CPA now, is Chartered Professional Accountants? Yes, Chartered yeah. Professional Accountants. Because now all like the CA, the CMA, and CGA, they're all under the umbrella of CPA. They do their own evaluation, but if they need assistance, they will refer you to another agency, but you should go directly to CPA mm -hmm. if you're an accountant or looking to get your designation in Canada. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the nursing question. Uh, we may have to get back to you on that one. That was the organization I was saying that's a, an overarching body that's taking on the process for evaluation. Uh, I think they're handling all of it, but I'll follow up and confirm that in the, in the follow-up of the email. We are working with certain organizations, I think it's the College of Teachers in Ontario, where we partner with certain organizations to, where we sort of do the document verification and provide certain background information to the, regulate, to the regulatory body or college. Uh, and then they go from there and do their competency evaluation assessments. But uh, I believe with the nurses, they're handling it all. I don't think we have any kind of relationship with them. So I don't think a WES evaluation it may or may not have value for that purpose. So I'll follow up. We'll, we'll look into that and follow up. Okay. So uh, to, to add on to Stephen's answer, just so everyone's clear, uh, the question was they have a WES evaluation and they are looking to apply to uh, another body another licensure body, and they're asking if we could send or forward the documents directly to um, that organization. So WES does have an ICAP service, which is the verification, and then we are able to send these documents out directly to any university, college, or licensing body. So yes, we could send it out. However, will it be enough to be accepted mm -hmm. by the organization? That's research that you will have to do. So if they will accept it, after doing your research, you find out they will accept it, you could definitely ask West to forward your documents directly to that university, college, or licensing body. Uh, someone else had asked if one already has a FSWP credential evaluation, is there a need to get another credential evaluation? Uh, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> it depends. Yeah, it depends. Depending on what your purpose for yeah. evaluation is or what you're looking to uh, pursue here in Canada. Um, whether it's to go back to school or to get licensed or just find employment, you have to do the research to see what the requirements are mm -hmm. for what it is that you want to do. Right. So, for example, if you wanted to go back to school, then you would contact the university in whatever program that you're looking to study for. If you wanted to go to licensing in a specific occupation, you would have to contact the licensing body. If you're looking for just employment, then you'd have to contact the potential employer that you're interested in working for. This question is, they have their credentials evaluated, but how does one get their credentials recognized without having to go back to school? I think it depends on what you are interested in doing. If you are just going back for, sorry, if you're just looking for employment, there are definitely, mm -hmm. um, as Stephen mentioned, some of the webinars yeah. that we... I was just about to say that. The ICT webinar, which I put the, the our, U, our YouTube page channel link in the chat, we actually had the Information Communications Technology Council participate and talk about the programs and services that they have available to people. But we also had two um, very good employers, IT companies, one in, uh, one in uh, Toronto, one in BC, but they actually have other offices in Canada and are global. And they talked about what they looked for. And interestingly enough, one of them were talking about, you just need to demonstrate that you can do the work. You know, they were a young, kind of quickly growing company. Uh, and then uh, I think it's similar to what the other company talked about as well. So in terms of getting recognized, I think if you can get the opportunity to demonstrate your abilities and competencies, uh, that can go a long way in the IT, IT sector. There are definitely some fields where, like, you just have to do some upgrading. And there's never anything wrong with upgrading your skills. I think um, one of the stats, I think it's on Stats Canada, where one in five internationally trained professionals who actually go back to school, they actually earn $10,000 more than their counterparts or than their colleagues that do not go back to upgrade their skills. So there are benefits 
to upgrading your skills. So we have a question about someone from Egypt that's an architect engineer. They live in Toronto. Which organize, organization should they contact to apply for a license? Well, first, are, are you looking, you know, again, it's about what your goal is. Are you looking for employment? Do you need to be a fully licensed architect to find some sort of employment that you would be interested in? Because, again, some companies that would hire an, uh, an architect would only need one or two but they, to do the sign-off on the designs and documents that a fully licensed architect would, but they would employ other people with essentially the same skill set. So uh, it depends if you're looking for licensure, then it is. The Ontario Association of Architects. Um, if you are planning to go to Ontario, we definitely have some bridge training programs mm -hmm. to help fill in the gaps and help you um, get into the yeah. workforce. There's a program offered by JVS Toronto called iPlan, and that's for internationally educated uh, architects. I believe that's still running as an effective program to help people get into the labor market. A lot of questions. Um, so someone, someone has a medical background, and they're asking if they may need to get uh, different credential evaluations or they can have it all done at once. Unfortunately, you will have to get more than one credential evaluation. If you are specifically going to the medical field, you would contact your licensing body, and they have their own uh, credential evaluation process. Now, if you want to think of an alternative career, you then may need to get a different credential evaluation because they wouldn't use the same one as the medical, the College of, of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. That is if you are planning to come to Ontario. Yeah. And for example, there's a wonderful program called uh, what is the Mentorship Program through the Toronto Region Immigrant Employment Council. And through that, recently I mentored an individual. Usually it's occupation, occupation, but the individual that they matched me with had a healthcare background. And in fact, they had a, a, a uh, bachelor's in medicine, essentially, from India. They also had an, uh, an MBA, a uh, master's in business administration, and an and an MPA, Master's in Public Administration. Now, the gentleman had practiced uh, medicine in India, but then he went on to work with a uh, large non-governmental organization related to health uh, promotion and protection, and then that's what he was exploring here in Canada rather than uh, pursuing being a doctor. And so he had uh, uh, an evaluation to, to kind of give the Canadian equivalency of his uh, medical, medical degree. The, his, his MBA was in the U.S., so that was a little bit easier to translate in terms of the Canadian context, uh, so he didn't have that evaluated. If you're going to pursue something uh, targeted in healthcare that would need a license, again, Sarah said you're going to need to have to you're going to have to do some research around that. But there are other options, you know, around uh, looking at health promotion and protection or public health administration, all things that uh, in various areas of the country are in, in demand as well. Um, another question is, do I need licensure if I'm a mechanical engineer and wanted to work in a maintenance job? Mm -hmm. Maintenance job, I'm stuck on that. Yeah, um, well, um, I think in some cases there may be people that would classify themselves as engineers that would oversee that in Canada that might fit some sort of occupation related to what they're talking about there. So it's a bit of the, the nomenclature, the wording isn't directly translated, if you will. So. Mm -hmm. Um, so for that person, uh, you'll have Depends to... Depends on the maintenance research. job. And when you say maintenance, almost the first thing that comes to my mind in the Canadian context, it's a, it's a lower level, um, you know, it could be anything related to fixing some sort of mechanical equipment, but you could be very well meeting some sort of boiler, which are, you know, something yeah. really engineering related. Uh, so it's important to really specify what you mean by that uh, when you say maintenance job. There's someone who is a teacher and wants to do their uh, early childhood education course, or should they send their degrees? Well, if you are looking to get um, the ECE or CECE license, you should contact them directly. They will provide you the steps, or you could always visit their websites, and um, they'll take you through it. And if it's, you're having some trouble or difficulties, just give them a call, as they will um, be glad to help you on your next step. And is that is that Pan Canadian or is that just Ontario? I think the C E C is Ontario. Okay. So it depends if you're going to another province. Sorry, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we have people in different provinces as well yeah. that are doing this. So if someone's asking about financial assistance towards 
um, education. I believe they qualify for OSAP. It depends right? on what province you're going okay. to. Uh, Sorry, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, in Ontario, there are a number of programs uh, like that I worked at the university. There are some bursary programs specific devoted for internationally trained individuals and program that's been developed for them to help them integrate into the labor market and then there's general student assistance but I think you have to be here for a period of time to qualify for that I'm not sure about that okay and I think some of the banks have a program for internationally trained professionals as well mm -hmm. um, and as Stephen mentioned each school there there's usually a bursary that you can apply for or grant um, that could help you out with the financial aspect of um, mm -hmm. going back to school. If you're going to BC, I know there's an organization called Success, and they're running, and there are a couple other organizations that are running a, a foreign credential recognition loan program. So if you, again, were looking to become licensed in some sort of provincially regulated occupation and you needed a WES evaluation didn't suffice for that purpose or you needed to do some additional training to qualify to write the exam, uh, there are some uh, very low, very low interest loans that are available, uh, funded in part by the Government of Canada that you could access, uh, but that's in BC and I think they're going to start that uh, in other provinces as well, uh, but success BC is another one. So someone has a BTEC in computer science with three years experience with IBM and they want to know if, they're, if they need to do a credential evaluation for job search in Canada. I would advise that you would try to apply to IBM directly, right? If you have the experience, and I'm not actually sure if IBM asks for a credential evaluation, but if they do, yes, get one. But otherwise, you could try to apply directly to them. If you're not getting a response, then maybe I would get my credentials evaluated because it's probably they don't understand or recognize your education from outside Canada. Uh, it depends on what you do uh, for IBM. Uh, that further complicates uh, B, uh, B Tech computer science. Okay, and, you know, I mean, if you've worked with IBM, I wonder if you could even get a transfer to Canada. It would be one thing to explore. But I think it, for jobs, you have if you're a West client. It depends. You can use any of the providers that are here in Canada. But if you're a West client, you already have one. That's a good first start for employment. And then it gets to demonstrating those skills and competencies specific to the job requirements that you would have and can demonstrate. So there's a mechanical engineer from India. They want to start their own mechanical engineering related work. So what kind of financial assistance? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that's what the question is. Uh, what kind of financial assistance can they use and what other things are required? When you say start your, your mechanical engineering related work, does that mean self-employment? You're going to start your own company or does that mean just launch your career? Because those are two different things. Financial help, yes. Okay. Uh, and again, um, there, there are, well, I'm guessing that you, because you're opening up your own business, you want some kind of entrepreneurial right. um, help. I yeah. think some of the banks have yeah. some assistance. There are small business advisors. There's a really wonderful organization called Mars Discovery District in Toronto, and they help. Uh, they have a, a tool that is a uh, funding portal, so you can get sources of funding in Canada in a variety of different ways. It could be from uh, loans from different sources, uh, grants from the government for tax purposes, if you will, and also uh, investment, uh, capital investors. Uh, that tool is very useful to kind of scrape all the funding sources that are available. Uh, it asks some specific things. Mars Every District focuses mostly on clean tech, bio, uh, health and biosciences, something to that effect. So, if you're in that area, it would be a good resource. Uh, the next question is, can anyone help me to guide to what kind of work I can start? I think we get this question a lot, and it's kind of, it's all it's always different for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so really, you have to look to yourself. What is it that you want to do? What are your interests? What are your passions? What are your skills? What are your education? What goals do you want to achieve? And then from there, you could research and discover what you'd be good at, or there's definitely some testing like uh, personality testing and yeah, stuff and that you can do. It's a really important part because when you go through the, a big life change of moving to a different country, it's, it's actually a decent point in life to do a bit of introspection and find out what you, 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 your interests are, your skills, your abilities are. It's to work with the province of Nova Scotia in the Department of Labor and Workforce Development around labor market information and what we often talk about were three concentric circles and where they intersect is where 
your best opportunities lie? And those were, what are your skills and abilities? Another one was, what are your interests? And another one is where are the actual employment opportunities uh, available? And so where those intersect, that's really where there is the greatest potential for finding uh, employment success. So that's what I would recommend. One of the questions is, do I need my educational transcripts to be carried with me for jobs or credential evaluation? Mm -hmm. Typically for jobs, they wouldn't require any educational transcripts. They may want to see what your credentials are equal to here in Canada mm -hmm. as an overview. Um, and for credential evaluation, it's best to look at the agency and see what their document requirements are mm -hmm. because they are all different. Yeah. So we have someone who is, who is in the hospitality industry. Employees in their country actually need a, a food handler's permit yeah. in order to work in the food and beverage it's, career. It's the same, yeah. And usually it's each province. I can't recall what it's, recall what it's called in Ontario, but it's, you know, first health or something. I can't remember what it's called, but yes, you know, there'd be something you would need to do in Alberta. It's not overly rigorous. It's not like a professional license, but it is a certification saying that taking the proper program. And those who are looking to get licensed, let's say, um, so some people who are in the licensing process, there are also definitely certifications that can help you into a different avenue. So maybe you don't want to go through with the licensure process, but there are certifications to help you mm -hmm. find employment in a, a similar field. So you're at least you're still doing similar work. Yeah. And then there's also in Canada so professional associations, or the or the, or the groups that really I guess promote and try and uh, advocate on behalf of different. Profession, they can be an effective group to join to, to work in a field, but perhaps not in a fully licensed manner. Question about studying. The question about is the value of a master's done evening, taking evening programs for a full day school, regular student program, which one's more valued? Uh, it's a toss up. One's not more valued than the other, I don't think. Uh, there are lots of executive MBAs that people take in professional as, as they're working in their career. They have a lot of value. Even some, uh, depending on where you're taking an online MBA, can be valued very well, very highly as well. Some educational institutions have uh, higher reputations for their MBA program, or their, their, their education in general, not just to talk about master's in business administration. You balance with, if you want to come out of a master's program at U of T, can you do it in the evening? And I think there are options to do it. But uh, if not, if you're in a different place in, in Canada where they don't have that option, then perhaps full-time day school is the right option. Because in the end, you're graduating with a master's of business administration anyway. It mm -hmm. shouldn't be any different. Just the, mm -hmm. the branding of where you got it yeah. may play a part in the employer's eyes to being better. Last two questions. It's an agricultural-related question for the two the two coasts of this country, British Columbia or Nova Scotia. Being from Nova Scotia, you'd think I would have that type of information. I don't, unfortunately. Do you know, uh, sorry, Go ahead. Uh, so Ontario, we have an agrologist body, so there's probably one in BC or Nova Scotia to kind of help guide you what your next steps are or how you can start your, your passions or your interests. What I'll say about Nova Scotia is, uh, you know, it's been a primary industry area for a long, long time. There's definitely farming there, but it is a short growing season season doing due to the colder winters, if you will. So perhaps if you're doing the, the farming inside, potentially. Uh, BC, depending upon where in the province you live, it can be a bit more temperate in terms of climate. So, But uh, in BC, uh, forestry is a really big sector. Not to say that agri uh, agricultural and farming is not, but uh, BC is known for its farming. So I think in both cases there's um, uh, examples. I'm just trying to think of where we could point people for that type of information. Um, usually the government website is a good place yeah. to start. Yeah. Just Google. Google is amazing. Once yeah, you is. type it in, a bunch of information will pop up. You just got to sort through research yeah. and then talk to people because there's definitely agencies in each province mm -hmm. that you may be able to contact for more information. And one thing also on the earlier question about the hospitality industry, the Canadian Tourism Sector Council has some pre-arrival uh, programming available that might be worth taking a look at for the individual that's in that sector in Northern Alberta. Uh, so Canadian Tourism Sector Council, I uh, would check it out uh, as well. Mm -hmm. The last question, someone is planning to come to Canada soon, when would be the best time to do so? And also kind of how to get started with uh, 
supporting themselves mm -hmm. and looking to use the resources here in Canada. Mm -hmm. Best time to do so depends on where you, what, what sector you work. For example, if you work in the government, there can be sometimes, there's always ongoing hiring, but in, in certain instances there's points where it gets a little higher, like in the fall or after April when federal, but when federal and provincial budgets are tabled, they have more available resources. Other sectors, again, it's all ongoing. Getting a job early is important. I would recommend you take a look at the job search webinar that we have, the LinkedIn webinar, the personal branding as well. Also, if you have been approved and are just waiting for your your uh, documents, there's the Canadian Immigrant Integration Program, and we did a webinar with them just a couple of days ago that's on our YouTube channel that they have some services that are available to help people navigate and even connect employers. If you're in ICT, the Canadian Information Communication Technology Council facilitates connections to employers, so it depends on what you do. Question about learn French and network. I think moving to a new country, this is just my own personal thinking, to, to take on finding employment, getting settled, then adding on learning a new language, and I've tried to study French as well, and it's even as a born in Canada individual, uh, it's not easy, even though I've been exposed to it my whole life. So I might put that lower in the priority level, depending upon what you do. If you're looking to work in federal government, then I would say, yeah, you should probably do that in parallel because it's a big requirement. Also, depending upon where you go, uh, if you're looking at opportunities in New Brunswick, New Brunswick, Canada is only officially bilingual province. Uh, there's also large French-speaking newcomer communities in different areas of Manitoba and Saskatchewan. So it depends on what you're looking to do. Where did the question go? Okay, and networking. The individual we did the personal branding webinar has done uh, also webinars, people preparing to come to Canada with a, a, an organization called Prepare for Canada, and she really detailed kind of where you should devote your time. And a large segment of it was networking, and she broke it down by like 35 hours a week. So if you're your job should be to find a job, and I know it's not as simple to say that you have other responsibilities, but you know, posting on job boards should equate with something around 5% of your time, and networking should be around 30, because a lot of jobs in Canada are, are hidden, so they're not posted and they're done through personal and professional referrals. And in fact, I can say anecdotally from my experience, it's been an absolute balance of half and half. Half jobs I've applied for and half jobs I've been referred to or asked to join through my network. Uh, so networking is key. I will say there's an initiative that will help, I think, anyone to get a better sense of where the opportunities may lie, and it's called Magnet. And I'll put the, the URL in the chat. So I invite you all to go build a profile. It takes a little bit of time. It's in-depth. But what it will do is it will, it scrapes all of the available jobs out there, and it pushes them to you, to your profile, based on a very detailed computer algorithm on not your job title, but your skills and competencies. So that'll give you a really good sense of what's out there. And as this initiative rolls out, one of the partners is the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, and they have 60,000 uh, small to mediums and large employers that are members of that chamber. And they're going to be posting their jobs there as well. And it will be a very targeted match, again, on that skills and competency-based level. Uh, so I'll put that in while Sarah looks at the next question is clear this one. We could keep going, but start searching for a job in Canada. Do I contact any agency? It depends on where specifically you are moving to here in Canada. There are definitely lots of agencies across Canada to help with the job search um, or Oops. to start searching for your job. As Stephen mentioned, if you are already outside of Canada and you have been approved for the FSWP or PNPA, yes, provincial um, nominee program, you can. Um, contact them and they will help you with this job search and provide you great information so that you can integrate into Canada more quickly. If you are already here in Canada, each province does have agencies that help with employment purposes. In Ontario, there, there are tons. There's mm -hmm. Center for Education and Training, Access Employment. Yes, Toronto, we could go on for hours. Yeah. And uh, Stephen mentioned success in BC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's tons. So again, just Google it. Usually, a good resource for, for finding those is the, the provincial government website. They usually have that listed. Google is probably by far the best answer. You um, got to know the right search term to be looking for. So in some ways, the government website will. Uh, so you can look up an employment agency or something of that sort. But yes, the government agency sometimes does list out um, all the agencies that are offered within the province. 
Great. So I think we are past our time now. I'm just going to put that one last URL in there. Okay, so Stephen's going to give you the last link, but we want to thank you very much for uh, attending the session and asking your questions. You will receive a recording of this session. Mm -hmm. um, so everyone who did register, you will get this shortly. And once Stephen pops that in, that would end our session. Yeah, so I'll put that in the chat. We won't close it just yet. And, but in the meantime, thank you for joining us. And good luck.